Well, it's good to be here. Uh, I, um, I'm honored to uh, be the mystery uh, speaker this morning. I didn't realize, but none of the announcements said anything about me being here, and I was uh, wondering a little bit if that was intentional. Uh, just wanted to make sure I had an audience or something like that. Uh, we're going to talk about faith, and no, I did not ask for any particular songs, so the songs just happen to line up. Uh, with what I had talked about, or what I had planned on talking about, I had uh, prepared this about a year ago, and then I was going to speak about a year ago, and and then I didn't get an opportunity, and then since then, I've had places to preach this in other uh, states. So now you get the benefit of me having already practiced it a f few times. I'm going to talk about faith from the standpoint of three people. Uh, first one we're going to look at is in Luke, the first chapter, and that's Zechariah. And it's kind of interesting to me that when we're talking about uh, the faith of people, and when we start looking at what they did and what they were given, that not everybody's faith showed through the same way. And a lot of times we get into a habit of picking on somebody's lack of faith or lack of perfect faith, and we forget to see that actually their lack of perfect faith was not an indication of no faith. It was just they weren't perfect at it. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're probably more likely to realize we too rarely have perfect faith, that we do absolutely everything incredibly perfect. But the first one is, is Luke, the first chapter, starting down in verse 5. Uh, I'm going to start reading, and it says, In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. And both of them were upright and in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were getting both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And many of the people of Israel will be, he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and to be disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now I'm going to t stop right there for a moment because there's several things I want you to understand about what's setting up here. Zechariah is a priest. Now, one of the duties of the priest is to know the scriptures. It's not like he's completely ignorant about what has been prophesied is going to happen. And when uh, the angel comes and tells him some things about what's going to happen, he's hinting at several Old Testament passages. And I'm not going to go to those passages but there are prophecies about being prepared for the Lord. There are prophecies about someone coming in the power of Elijah. There are prophecies about all these th things. Everything that the angel says is predicted. So he's saying basically what has been predicted, you should know about it, understand it's coming true. Oh, by the way, you're part of it. That's really kind of what he says. Now, there's a couple of things also to understand about what's going on here is that he's inside the temple. People don't just walk into this part of the temple. This is a quiet place. Matter of fact, there's some things that would suggest, I, and I don't remember exactly where I've read it before, uh, that would suggest that when the priest, they got to the point where they weren't so sure about when and how often someone was allowed to be in the presence of God, but they were so concerned that somebody might die in the presence of the Lord that they would actually tie a rope to their ankle 
as the priest went in, and then if he didn't come out in the specified amount of time, or gave some indication that he was still alive and hadn't been struck dead by the wrath of God, if they had to, they'd pull him out. They wouldn't even go in to recover a dead body. Such was their desire not to offend God in any way. Now, that's kind of interesting because they also had guards outside. It was a regular thing. One of the duties of the priests was to guard the temple. No one goes into this part of the temple except the priest under certain circumstances going through the proper ceremony. So when, when Zechariah is in there and sees somebody else there, he should have been able to put two and two together and figure out, oh, okay, this is not your ordinary person because he should not have been panicked at all he should have realized, hold on a second, somebody's here who's not supposed to be here, and I don't recognize them, therefore they have to be important. But he didn't put two and two together. Matter of fact, it doesn't sound like he put one and one together, or three and three, or any other number combination you might have come up with. He asked probably what we all remember, the dumbest question yet. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now, this is going to become important later when we look at another character, but I just want you to know, he asks a question. And it's going to sound very much like the next question, but this time he gets into trouble. He gets into trouble for asking a question because it's coming from fulfillment of Scripture and obviously somebody who's authorized to speak on behalf of God because he's inside the temple. All right, those two things are there. Now, what the angel says is, as I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. Now, I, I want to stop right there because I think sometimes we don't understand who Gabriel is. Yes, he gets mentioned a couple of times. He's one of the few angels, as a matter of fact, only one of two angels ever mentioned by name. He says that I stand in the presence of God. You think about all the interactions that are in the scriptures where people see a vision and are in the throne room of God. Where are they? Flat on their face. They fall trembling before the throne. Matter of fact, the throne scene in uh, Revelation, the elders are before the throne. And uh, in uh, in 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 bowing before the throne. Night and day they bow before the throne. Everyone that's mentioned, with the exception of Gabriel, bows in the presence of God. Gabriel says, I stand. Now, if you think back in the, the times of the kings, in, in our time and day, if you went into the presence of the king, you could be given dispensation to stand. You don't have to bow in my presence. You're my trusted advisor. You're my right-hand man. You're my whatever, and then would be allowed to stand. Gabriel is that important. He stands. He gets to stand. Basically, I get to stand in the presence of God. Wow. We're, talking about, we're not talking about just any ordinary messenger. We're talking about the messenger, the main messenger of God for this occasion. Also remember... Gabriel is mentioned in the book of Daniel and is the one who gave the passages that he basically is just now quoting, saying, I, I told you through Daniel this was coming. So both of those, he's there. You've, I've been speak, spent to speak to you this good news, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Now, I find that all fascinating because I think, oh, what did Zechariah just do? He probably spoke too quickly. That would be my first thing. Is it, you know, if I were going to put a fault on him, I'd think, no, stop, stop. Something unusual is going on. Just stop, think. Think, think, think. What's going on? Put this all together. No, nope. blurted it out of his mouth. Oh, we're... We're old people. How in the world could that happen? Um, it's God that's telling you this. Don't doubt. Now, he was accused of not believing. So, 
Let's hold off on him just a little bit. We're going to come back to his, his story a little bit. Now, we're going to jump over and now talk about Joseph. Joseph, his story is in Matthew, the first chapter. So you have to jump over to Matthew, the first chapter, to kind of follow along. And this one is kind of interesting because Joseph has told us uh, his story, kind of interacts with Mary's story. And if you haven't kind of figured it out, I'm going to go to Mary next. Mary's story and Joseph's story. Now, one of the things I find interesting is, is that uh, I think because there are certain religious groups that put so much emphasis on Mary, they completely forget Joseph's even there. I mean, it's almost like uh, Joseph who uh, in, in there. But he's got a really cool uh, interaction with angels, too. Now, let's look, starting down in verse uh, 19. Or eight, let's say 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to marry, be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, here, what, what's going on here? The, you try to get inside the mind of Joseph. Joseph, first of all, says he's a righteous man. I don't know that we understand the, that it's possible to be righteous. We, we put such a high mark on righteousness that we think it's unattainable. And therefore, when uh, we look at a passage that says, and Joseph was a righteous man, we automatically think, oh, he must have been a self-righteous person. He, might have, he must have thought he was righteous. That's not coming from uh, himself. This isn't Joseph saying, and, uh, you know, I was a righteous person. This is coming from God. God said, he's a righteous individual. He met a certain standard. Now, in order to be righteous, that means he was interested in making sure he followed the law. And he made, wanted to make sure that he was doing the right things, and so he was prepared to do the right things and divorce Mary. Now, in that time, if you, once you were engaged, it was like you were married, and you had to go through the process of divorce even before you went through the, the wedding ceremony. So, a little bit different than the way that we do things, but in, he's just looking at it and saying, okay, hold on a second, I'm going to go through the process because she's pregnant and I know I'm not the father. I mean, it's kind of like proof de facto that I, uh, you know, that something was going on here. Now, it's, at, at this point in time, Mary has already been visited. We're, we're going to talk about her last, but Mary has already been visited. It's quite possible Mary tried to explain it to him. Uh, you, you know, well, you know, this angel came and said, uh, you know, I'm going to have a, 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 a baby, and, and Joseph is kind of like, okay, too weird. Uh, that's just, you know, too much for him. Uh, you know, it's, it's also possible that um, he was looking for a reason not to put Mary away. Maybe he wanted to believe Mary, but he's just, he's just up against that thing. It says, this is, you know, this is uh, just a little bit too much. This is just, a, you know, no, I see what the law says, and I've got to go with what the law says, which is really to his credit. And uh, so, you know, he was, might be, you know, well, you know, there's some odd things happening right now. Maybe I'll keep my eye out for something. But when the angel comes to him in a dream, notice what he does. He does exactly what the angel suggested. It's almost like, boom, he's over. Now, I don't know what his dreams are like. I, if it's anything like one of my dreams, oh, um, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that dreams virtually constantly all night long. And I, I'm just kind of, uh, if it's anything like one of my dreams, I'm just thinking, how in the world would anybody bother to believe that? Uh, but when he comes in and it says, okay, no, Joseph, don't be afraid. Take her as your wife. Wow. What would that do for you? 
Now, maybe it was a little different dream. I, you know, there's not a whole lot of detail here. Maybe it was obvious that this was an out-of-ordinary dream. Maybe he's not one of those people who dreams, and to have a dream at all was unusual. But whatever it was, Joseph then did. You notice, he, no questions, no doubting. He's not, e- he's not even like, you know, Gilead came and had an angel vi- visit him, and when he had an angel visit, uh, visit him, he, well, prove to me that this is true. Prove to me this is true. Never ask for proof. Oh, okay, I guess it is true. We're good, go. And that's all he does. Right he needed no more proof. Whatever was going on inside his mind, he was at that point, he only needed that little nudge. And his nudge wasn't even as big as Zechariah or Mary's nudge. Zechariah and Mary get the big news. They get the personal visits. Joseph, just a dream. Now, he's actually really kind of interesting. If we keep going with Joseph, go down to uh, chapter 2 and verse 13. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared, talking about when, after the wise men come and visit. It says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. Now, we don't think that much about getting up in the middle of the night and going anywhere because, yeah, well, okay, yes, it's the middle of the night, the street lights are fine, and if that's not, their headlights will shine plenty bright. We don't even think about it. It's the middle of the night. Let's get up, let's go somewhere. This is a time period where, you know, the stars are out. If the clouds cover the stars just a little bit, it's dark. That's the time when thieves and robbers are on the wayside. Uh, if nothing else, just walking along, you trip, you, know, you trip on a rock, you step on a thorn. It's, you know, leaving it in the middle of the night's not a good option, not a good time. And I don't think from the way that this is read that he waited for three days and then went in the middle of the night. I got the impression he had that dream. He jumped up and said, whoop, Time to go, right now. And he just jumped and went. That's the way it looks like to me. It just, up, time to go, let's go, right now. Herod's coming and we're going. And so that's exactly what he does. Fabulous attitude. A dream, says, and he gets up, okay, I've had another one of those dreams, let's go. It's coming true. I think everything that he's, he looks at, he says, okay, this is coming true. Uh, another fact, let's jump down to 19, same chapter there. Uh, it says, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in, to, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, go to the land of Israel. Didn't say go to the land of Judah. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead, so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. So all of those things that he did, he did based on very limited information, but he was obviously absolutely convinced it came from God. And he didn't hesitate, he just went. Now, what's kind of interesting is is after this point, we hardly hear anything about Joseph. I mean, there's the story about, you know, Joseph and Mary and and when Jesus was 12 and and those kinds of things. There's a few things in there, but Joseph does not ever play a prominent role in the rest of the, the, uh, the story about Jesus. But he did play a crucial role at the beginning because he was a righteous individual trying to do what God wanted to do, and when God said move, he moved. Fabulous attitude. So now let's jump over to to Mary, going back to Luke, the first chapter again. 
and, you know, and Mary's got a couple of different stories through here, so, uh, but I like the one for uh, what we're going to say is, is down here in Luke, the first uh, verse chapter. Well, got a good packed page. You get used to the electronic stuff, and then you forget how paper works. <laughs> okay, this is now going back in time. This is before Joseph. It's after uh, Zechariah's visit. It's before Joseph's dreams. Uh, it, but starting in verse 26, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I want to just stop there and think about that one just a moment. When somebody comes and says, Oh, hi, that you've never met before. Hi, you are highly favored. Uh, in, any, in, in any context, but to say, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. He said, Okay, what kind of greeting is this? Now, sometimes greetings like that are because somebody's trying to flatter you, trying to get in on your good side. Sometimes it's because somebody knows you and you don't know why they know you. And, some, and so I'm, I'm trying to... Th figure out, okay, put yourself in Mary's head for a little bit, trying to figure out, what does she know at this point? Does she know about Elizabeth? Well, the indication is a little later, nope, she doesn't know about Elizabeth yet. But she, uh, uh, and it doesn't sound like maybe if she doesn't know about Elizabeth, she may or may not have known about Zechariah being visited by Gabriel. Uh, it's hard to kind of tell. Uh, because she's not of the priestly tribe, it's hard to tell how much of the uh, Old Testament passages that she knows about what's supposed to come. Uh, but it's possible that she knows quite a bit that, you know, that, uh, you know, you who are highly favored. And I th suspect she probably knows the stories of the Old Testament. And when somebody comes and says, you who are highly favored by the Lord, that usually comes with, something tough to do you notice every time in in judges and with the kings that when god shows up and says your favor your favorite of god usually means and therefore i want you to do a list of things to do it's not always it doesn't always just come with a oh well thanks i appreciate that that that's nice it's kind of like okay what's what's happening what's coming who is this person? What is he bringing me here? Okay, so there's all sorts of things here. He says, now remember, this is, this is an important angel. And so Mary was greatly troubled, wondered what kind of greeting this would be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Now, uh, he said that again. You notice that? Matter of fact, I heard somebody not long ago say, how, many, how often, and I forgot, I should have wrote it down how often the phrase, do not be afraid, shows up in the Bible. Well, that kind of implies that being afraid is kind of natural. And he says, no, no, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Now, I cannot think, if I began to believe, okay, this person's coming from God, and somebody says, oh, God's found favor with you, I just can't think that... I. I to me, it's going to start running through my head. Wow, that is awesome to be favored by God. That is, I, I mean, it's going to hit, it's going to trigger something in my head, and I'm going to get excited. Oh, oh, I'm favored by God? Or it's possible they could, ooh, hold on a second, God knows who I am? Uh, I was kind of hoping to keep a low profile. Uh, one of those two reactions. I kind of think it's probably the excitement part. You will be with a child, give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow. Okay, that sounds rather normal. 
And then she asks, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, this gets into, is this a dumb question? Remember, Zechariah asked the question like, well, how can that be? We're old. She's basically saying, how can that be? I don't even have a husband yet. I, you know, this isn't going to work. Unless that's not why she was asking the question. If you think about it, most women have children at some time in their life. It's kind of like a, a natural thing. If she is a virgin and, and she's engaged to be married, and maybe she's just kind of like, well, okay, so does that mean Joseph is going to marry me finally? Uh, does this mean uh, that somebody else is coming along? Does this mean, okay, so what's the plan here? I don't think that her attitude is one of, I doubt your words, so much as it is, is okay, so what do I do? What, what, what's my part of this? It's a difference in the way the question is phrased. You notice Gabriel's not angry at Mary. Gabriel was angry with Zechariah. Zechariah had all sorts of things going in, in, uh, that he should have been able to pick out. But Mary doesn't have all those things to pick out. She's just got the stranger who shows up, says, you're blessed by God. You're going to have a kid. Oh, okay. Uh, you're going to name him Jesus. He's going to be extremely important. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so what's the game plan? At this point, everything is natural. He says, but he then tells her, uh, the more interesting news. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who ha was said to be barren in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Now I'm going to stop there. Just think about what he she was just told. She said he wanted to know what's your point in this. Ab do absolutely nothing. That's probably the best assignment God ever gave anybody. Do nothing. It's all happening to you. You just sit back, relax, and if you need some proof, Elizabeth is, is going to have a kid. Okay, now the fact that Elizabeth is going to have a kid probably is a little on the unusual side. I assume that she knows who Elizabeth is. It said, you know, but she was barren. Okay, that's all the proof that she needed. Can you imagine that? All the proof that I need to know that this phenomenal thing that is going to happen to me is that, oh, by the way, somebody else got pregnant. That's not a whole lot to ask for. It's not like go out and have the fleece wet and the ground dry and the ground dry and the fleece wet and uh, I think I said that backwards both the same way. Uh, in, in either way, uh, it's not like asking for, for sign upon sign upon sign. But if you think about it, why would she need any sign? If it comes true, it comes true. If it doesn't come true, it's kind of a, at worst, a, well, okay, that was an interesting conversation with the the person who didn't had an addled brain or something like that they told you something that wasn't going to be true there was nothing that she had to commit to because there was nothing that was being required of her but she had that determination now this i think is probably a culmination of the whole thing because i absolutely adore mary's answer that's all she gets she's told a story she's told she's special She's going to have a kid. She's not to get married yet. 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. That is fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. It's just, you're right. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be as you said. Can you imagine a more humble answer to a more charged uh, environment. I mean, I, to me, if this was happening, I think I, my emotions would be just hitting the sky, uh, ceilings, if there was a ceiling there. If this was outside, 
you know, hits the clouds. Uh, my emotions would just be, go whoa, whoa, whoa. Would I even have the presence of mind to realize I, what I'd just been told? And then to realize the consequences of what I've just been told, and then have the presence of mind to say, yep, whatever you say, I'm the Lord's servant. You can do whatever you want with me. Whatever you require, that I will do. Now that's really where I wanted to, to end up on this one, because I think that's fabulous. Just absolutely fabulous if you think about these three characters. Now Zechariah we pick on, because Zechariah kind of stumbles a little bit. But you know what? He didn't get struck dead. He just had to be quiet for a while. You know, kind of like apropos for his offense. His offense was he talked too fast, and his uh, penalty was as if for at least nine months you're going to have your mouth button shut. You know, kind of understand. Learn to listen before you speak. Joseph is fabulous. Little hints, good enough, I'm on, I'm on it. That's all he needed. Little hint, he's on it. Mary, big challenge, and she, I'm a servant. All of those are just absolutely fabulous attitudes. Really, when you come down to it and just say, I will, I will, I will. That's what God wants of us. Ultimately, there's things that the world looks at and says, well, I don't understand. You know, I, and I think baptism is probably the number one thing. Is people look at, I don't understand how baptism is going to save me. You know what? I don't think that Mary understood how she was going to become pregnant without having a man first. I don't think that Zechariah kind of understood how uh, he was going to have a kid in his old age. I don't know that even Joseph understood how he knows all these things and why this was all happening to him. There's no indication that they always understood. But they did understand one thing. It came from God. God said, do it then do it. So if in any way that you're subject to the invitation of God and you need to become right with God, one of those steps, obviously, well, all the steps is to hear and then believe, to repent, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized with him for the remission of your sins. If you're at all subject to that invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?